my perspective. And my perspective comes from being a Asian data scientist. So for, for my work, typically what I'm interested in is analyzing uh, big data sets, but also complex data sets. So for example, uh, here uh, I'm visualizing over 23,000 uh, Ebola virus cases uh, from between the years 2014 and 2016 in Western Africa. And uh, I've got the spatial data and I've got the, the temporal data on the right. Uh, but I also have genome data. I also have viral RNA for a subset of these uh, of these viruses. And, and what I'm interested in doing is reconstructing uh, an evolutionary family tree and, and then actually learning which subsets of, of this of this family tree are more contagious. And then uh, so this is this is uh, big data, complex data. How do we model it all at once? Now, this is a completely different area of application. This is looking at structural brain data in, in different uh, healthy and Alzheimer's patients over time. And, uh, and I'm looking at cortical thickness measurements in 62 different regions of the brain. And, and, and what complicates this issue a lot is that I have different actual uh, technologies, different uh, pipelines that process MRI data and then uh, and then actually so they process the raw images and they actually output cortical thickness measurements which are good measurements of, of the health of these different brain regions so each row here is actually a different pipeline and then with this data i also have uh, a number of different scores that that patients uh, from from tests that patients are doing, that's testing the patient's memory. And I wanna know how all of this pipeline data uh, actually relates to clinical outcomes. So when I'm modeling mixed type data like this, uh, either genome data with, with locations uh, or, or, or maybe these outputs uh, from, these, from these different uh, pipelines and then with these clinical outcomes, what I do, in order to model this, this complex data is I build a hierarchical model. And this hierarchical model models everything at once. So for example, um, if I wanna model the spread of viruses, then I can use uh, a point process to do that or a Poisson point process to do that. And here uh, is, the, is the rate function of a very specific Poisson point process that's useful for modeling the spread of viruses. And you can see that because after an event, the rate increases. So after I see a virus, the probability of seeing another virus actually increases. But this kind of model is only really useful for modeling the spread of viruses where I've got maybe temporal or, or spatial data. Um, but it doesn't work if I have genome data, if I have that viral RNA. So what I do is I build a big hierarchical model that models the viral evolution on the left. It models the actual um, the actual point process, the actual spatiotemporal data on the right, and then it's tied together in the middle using something called a latent variable, where I have a different variable that's unobserved for each observation. And there's different ways of actually visualizing hierarchical models like this. Uh, so here is an example. Uh, actually, this is from the, the, the cortical thickness, uh, the brain region data, uh, where I'm actually where a red circle is something that I've actually observed. So here I've got the different cortical thickness measurements uh, for the different pipelines for different individuals at different times. I've got the time at which the measurement occurred. I might have some ancillary, some extra data. And then I've got the outcome, which is uh, the patient score on a cognitive exam. And then the blue are unobserved parameters, or, or, or again, I wanna use this term, this, uh, the, the, the 
latent variables. So I've got um, cortical thickness here which is a latent variable, meaning I have one for every observation. Uh, so uh, in order to interpret this sort of graph, uh, if I have a big box with a letter in it, K, that means that everything inside of it, I have K copies of it. So I've got K uh, data processing pipelines. I've got I individuals, the outer box, the inner box. I've got J visits. So each individual is going to come into the doctor J times to get their MRI taken. So actually, these cortical thickness IJs, I, it's a lot of, of unobserved parameters in my model uh, because I have, if I have I individuals and I have J, uh, J visits, then it's I times J. So if I have a thousand individuals coming in 10 times each, all of a sudden my model has over 10,000 parameters. Now, I'd argue that uh, actually the Bayesian uh, inferential paradigm is is good for for uh, learning from hierarchical models. And to argue this, I want to make things a little bit more formal. So if we assume that our data Y n are are actually generated uh, randomly and independently according to a distribution where it's Y n conditioned on theta where theta is a global parameter shared by all my data, and then Zn, that's a latent variable associated with Yn. And if I give both the global parameter theta and the latent variable Z, if I give each one of them uh, a prior distribution, then Bayes' theorem says that the posterior distribution of theta conditioned on my data is actually uh, proportional to the ratio between two integrals. And actually the dimension of the integration domain is gonna grow with the size of my data. And you can see that because it involves integrals over these latent variables. So actually these integrals are going to be uh, massive and they're gonna be so big that I can't use quadrature. I can't use uh, numerical integration. I certainly can't use closed form integration or uh, analytic integration. So instead of integrating, I'm going to use Markov chain Monte Carlo to generate samples from the joint posterior distri distribution of Z, all the latent variables, and theta, uh, the global parameters conditioned on the data. Now, now this is computationally demanding, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use very advanced MCMC algorithms, and then I'm going to find out what their computational bottlenecks are, and I'm going to parallelize their computational bottlenecks. So for example, uh, I'm going to use a, an advanced uh, MCMC algorithm that uses gradient calculations, that's the top row, and then it uses Hessian, uh, calculations. That's the bottom row. So the results are pretty much the same with the same interpretation. So I'm going to focus on the top row, the gradient calculations. So on the left, we have the, the Y axis is the relative speed up where I'm actually uh, analyzing 25,000 observations. And uh, the X axis is the number of C CPU cores that I'm engaging. Now my baseline is a fast uh, version of a single core computing that uses SIMD or AVX processing. And you can see that as I increase the number of threads that actually I get some pretty uh, serious speed ups, but that I then get diminishing returns. Now, if I engage the GPU at the top, then I can get over 100 fold speed ups. Now we can also visualize uh, if we vary the number of observations. So on the right, our X axis is the number of observations going from 5,000 to 90,000. And then the Y axis is the, the seconds per evaluation. Uh, so actually on the right side, lower is better. And we've got one thread, two threads, four threads, all the way down to 104 threads. And then finally, we've got the GPU, which is outperforming everything else. So 
these are the computational bottlenecks, and I'm then going to plug them into a, a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm or, or hybrid Monte Carlo, uh, where I'm using a, a preconditioned and adaptively preconditioned mass matrix. And what I have to do is I have to generate, uh, for this specific model, I generated 100 million Markov chain states, which is, which is a lot. And uh, I, I did this at a rate of 3.5 million samples a day using a very, very large uh, NVIDIA GV100 GPU. And this whole thing took a month. Uh, so this is an example of parallelizing my within chain computations within a single Markov chain. Now, uh, the reason that I had to do this, how, the reason I had to generate so many Markov chain states, 100 million, is, is that uh, actually it's a very difficult, this hierarchical model has a very difficult um, posterior distribution with very difficult geometry. And which hierarchical model is this? I should have said earlier, this is the, the viral, uh, the, the Ebola virus model uh, from, from 2014, 2016. Uh, the model only has uh, over 1300 parameters and uh, the x-axis, this is a histogram on the left, where the x-axis is the effective sample size, which is giving me a measure for how many independent samples my MCMC has generated. Basically, I take all, I take the number 100 million, the total number of states I've generated, and I divide by the autocorrelation in order to get an idea of, of actually how many independent states I have. And you can see that on the far left, I still have some parameters that only have 200 independent samples of 100 million Markov chain states. And one of the reasons is because a lot of these parameters are multimodal or double or multi-weld. Uh, so here you see this is the posterior density for a single parameter, uh, and it, it, it makes it very hard to move between these modes. Now that was parallelizing within a chain using a GPU, uh, but we can also, uh, it's actually easier, we can parallelize between chain computations. Uh, so here, all that I do, this is the cortical thickness model that I talked about earlier. All that I do is I generate 100 parallel chains, assigning one chain to each core of my, uh, to each processor core of a big computer. And uh, I use an advanced, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo like algorithm called the no U turn algorithm with again with an adaptive mass matrix. So again, combining parallel computing with advanced MCMC algorithms. And then what we have here is a histogram over all 21,000, roughly 21,000 model parameters. And this is after running for three months. So this is an this is 100 MCMC chains that I'm running for three months. Or if we think in terms of user time, then that's 10,000 days that I'm actually running these chains. And when I combine them and look again at their effective sample sizes, which is giving me a measure of the independent samples that I'm generating. So when I combine all 100 chains, I still have a large number of parameters with barely any independent samples. So I want to give you the context that I'm coming from and what makes me interested in quantum uh, quantum computing, uh, but I'm also motivating uh, the, the work that I'm presenting today, which with, with the fact that neither within nor between uh, chain parallelization is a silver bullet. So neither within chain nor between chain parallelization is getting me where I need to be with my models, unless I want to run these models for half a year. So I'm asking two questions today. The first question is, can we adjust the deeper algorithmic structure of MCMC uh, to increase its parallelism? So that's the first one. Can we actually change the algorithmic structure? And then two, uh, can we leverage uh, par this parallelism using uh, emerging computational technologies, uh, GPUs, but also quantum computing. So this is actually a good place to stop and to take some questions if you have any.
Any question? No. Yep. It's good. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so to answer these questions, let's take a step back. And uh, uh, I work a lot in the continuous domain uh, with continuously valued measures. So, uh, so this is uh, this. I'm gonna I'm gonna present things uh, uh, in terms of uh, continuous measures, but this will also hold for discrete measures. So uh, we consider a probability distribution pi, and this pi has uh, a distribution uh, with arguments theta, where theta is in some big D dimensional Euclidean space. And then to generate samples from this target distribution pi, uh, I'm going to build a, a kernel that's centered at a state theta naught. Uh, that, that is then going to be a, a, a transition kernel to another state in my domain. And I want this kernel to satisfy this equation right here, which means that it leaves the target distribution invariant. So the target distribution is a fixed point for my for my kernel. Now the I think the classic example of something that does this is the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, which which builds the transition kernel by first generating a proposal theta according to this uh, uh, according to a proposal kernel Q and this proposal kernel has a density centered at theta naught uh, where theta is its argument. And, and then I accept this theta uh, with, with a certain famous probability at this point, which I probably don't need to tell you, but it involves the ratio of uh, the target probabilities, pi, and then also a ratio of the proposal probabilities, q. And this kernel maintains, um, maintains detailed balance or reversibility, and because of that, it's easy to show that it actually leaves the target distribution invariant. But uh, can we actually increase the parallelism of MCMC uh, beyond this? So uh, one thing that we can do is we can use something that here I'm calling, it has many different names, uh, such as multiple try uh, metropolis. Uh, it also has uh, waste recycling is another name. Uh, but here I'm just calling it parallel MCMC. Uh, and there's many citations, but but this is a good one. And it, it builds such a transition kernel by actually generating P, uh, capital P different proposals. So maybe 2000 different proposals. And I'm, I'm calling all of these proposals theta minus zero. And and uh, they're theta one to theta P. And then we we propose them from some joint distribution where again, I'm using a similar notation. Q here is the density for the probability of proposing all the proposals. And then we select the next state of the Markov chain using these acceptance probabilities, which are which are proportional to again the target evaluate the excuse me, the target evaluated at that specific proposal. And then the probability of starting from that one proposal proposing everything else. So I said minus zero earlier. Uh, but 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 minus P means the same thing. It means that we have this big set and we're just leaving out the P proposal. And and this kernel also maintains detailed balance and therefore leaves the target distribution invariant. And uh, and actually. In my experience, these cues. Uh, we've got we've got to evaluate them for each one of these proposals from zero to P, where zero is the current state, but let me call it a proposal. And it's the probability of proposing all the other proposals. So actually computing a single one of these queues is often linear in the number of proposals, and then computing all of them is quadratic in the number of proposals. So we want to just not have to compute it. So we can simplify these acceptance probabilities and get rid of those proposal terms using different proposal mechanisms. And one of them that I'm going to use today is uh, it, it follows a two step 
uh, process. So first, uh, this theta naught is my current state, and I'm going to generate some theta bar, which I'm calling my center. I'm going to generate some theta bar from a normal distribution. It doesn't have to be normal dis a normal distribution, but I'm just going to say a normal distribution in this talk. And then once I have that center theta naught, I'm then going to generate uh, my p proposals conditioned on that on that theta bar. Excuse me, I said theta naught. I meant theta bar. So then, uh, what this accomplishes, and I'm not going to actually prove this to you, but what this accomplishes is it accomplishes kind of a higher order symmetry where the probability of proposing everything conditioned on theta naught is the same as the probability of proposing everything conditioned on theta one, et cetera, et cetera. And because all these proposal terms are equal, uh, the, the acceptance probabilities uh, simplify so that we just have this, this term, uh, so that they're all just proportional to the target distribution evaluated at the different proposals. So this is gonna save us uh, a p squared computational complexity. Now, uh, this is a great algorithm, right? So here I'm looking at 10,000 iterations of of this of a single Markov chain, and this algorithm is so wonderful that it adapts to uh, target distributions that are that have interesting geometry and that are multi-weld or multimodal, which are these are kind of two of the 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 two of the the horrible things that a target distribution can be. So uh, here this is a toy example, but I think it's a little bit fun is I construct a five moded uh, target distribution where each mode one, two, three, four, five has a banana shape. Each mode is a banana distribution, which is which is uh, has in some interesting geometry and is very hard for uh, MCMC uh, algorithms to actually sample from. And you and then the lines in the top left, these are actually the sample paths. I'm using 2000 proposals at each iteration, and you can see that I can I can very easily jump between my modes. And then uh, in the bottom left, in the top right, I just have uh, one dimensional projections of the Markov chain so that you can see uh, that they're mixing efficiently. So cool, this is a success. Uh, what's the downside? Well, the, the good thing is that uh, this algorithm is fast and it's flexible when I when I measure things on an iteration by iteration basis. Right, so each Markov chain, uh, each 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 uh, when I look at the actual um, states of my Markov chain, it looks like I'm doing a really good job. But uh, the con, the negative aspect is that each iteration of my of my MCMC requires a linear uh, 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 an order P uh, number of evaluations of the target distribution pi. In big data settings that I work, those target evaluations are incredibly expensive. And when I have a big hierarchical model, they're even more expensive. So while the algorithm looks successful, when I look at it by an iteration by iteration basis, it does not look very successful when I actually look at the number of target evaluations that I have to perform in order to accomplish that performance. So these evaluations, uh, one thing that uh, that a computer scientist might automatically note is that actually these target evaluations are independent of one another. They don't rely on one another. So then uh, what we could say is great, let's parallelize these using a quantum computer. Well, how would we do that? I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy here because this is not what I'm proposing. Well, we start uh, with all of our qubits set to with n plus one qubits set to zero. We put the first n ones in superposition and then following the classic way, we somehow evaluate the target, uh, the target density over each one of these, uh, each one of these states. Of course, I'm being hand wavy here because I'm ignoring the fact that this pi, well, that's actually a continuously valued function. Um, 
of course, let's just assume that we have some sort of, uh, so that we're using finite precision and that we have um, a binary expansion. But, but still, uh, let's suppose that we are actually able to evaluate this target uh, density over a number of different states using the quantum computer at the same time. So now I've put some question marks here to say that something's wrong. Well, uh, a quantum circuit could actually theoretically evaluate each one of these uh, target densities over all these proposals at the same time uh, using quantum parallelism. Uh, but the problem is that once we've done that, we can't look under nature's hood, right? We can't actually uh, get uh, access to all of those values at the same time, right? We can, at best, we could probably access one uh, upon quantum measurement. Okay, so the next question is, uh, maybe we can use the same or use uh, an extended quantum circuit to actually not only evaluate those uh, target densities, but also to sample uh, at what I'm calling uh, P hat uh, from a discrete distribution where the probabilities are given right here. So maybe we can combine the evaluation of the target density with the sampling itself within a quantum circuit. So it's a question mark, uh, maybe, uh, but uh, a big problem here that I couldn't figure out how to do it uh, in a direct way is I don't know how to handle these summations, these normalizations in the, in the bottom where we're actually adding up all of these pies. So, so I, I'm sure that it could be done, but I solved this problem in a different way. Um, so I'm going to uh, enter in on, on a kind of a detour, but uh, maybe if you have any questions now, uh, if I can clarify anything, please let me know. Uh, we have a question here. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry, I, I'm just uh, confused about the Mark Markov chain you are trying to use to uh, produce several samples from different theta. Is that right? Uh, you are trying to parallelize the, yes. the the way how how we can sample all these theta, and then you are trying to make uh, take advantage of the quantum algorithm to, to, to do that at the same time. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And actually, so just to clarify, because this is kind of important, is the um, generating the proposed states is easy. So those theta p, so here, theta 1 to theta p, that's easy. The, the challenging thing, is evaluating the target distribution at each one of these proposals. Sorry, what, what do you mean the targeting? What? So pi is the, that's that's the, the distribution that I'm targeting. That's the distribution that I want to ultimately that I'm using MCMC to generate samples from. So pi is pi is the distribution that I'm interested in. Then, uh, how, how how's the relation to the sample X? I mean, you you, you are uh, using a sample from some fixed theta, right? Then why you choose different theta to do the sampling? Yes. So the reason why I'm using different thetas is because, well, it turns out that using multiple proposals at once. It makes MCMC more parallelizable, but it also makes it more efficient on an iteration by iteration basis. So the algorithm outperforms Metropolis Hastings when I actually look at the, the, the each iteration of MCMC. But there's a 
computational overhead, which is that in order to choose from these different proposals, I need to evaluate I at each one of them. So that's that's the that's the downside that, that I'm gonna try to fix using a quantum computer. Uh, so for different theta deviated from the given theta not you uh, from uh, different theta uh, from deviated from the target theta uh, do, do you bound the deviation from all these different samples to get the final result? Uh, so I'm only going to accept one and I'm going to do that by sampling from this discrete distribution. So which is basically just saying I've got P plus one values and I'm going to randomly select one uh, using these probabilities here. OK, you just uh, select one, OK? Yes, yeah, yes. Thanks for asking. OK. OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. OK, so uh, are we are we good? Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, we are good. OK, great. So uh, in order to actually do this using a, a quantum computer, I'm first going to review something that I think is kind of cool. I think it's like a mathematical magic trick. It's called the Gumbel Max trick. So this is a Gumbel distribution. Um, uh, typically, a Gumbel distribution has a location parameter and a scale parameter, so it has two parameters. Uh, but here we're just interested in the standard Gumbel distribution, which has a uh, location parameter zero and a scale parameter one. And, and this is what it looks like. It has a short tail on the left and it has a, a long tail on the right, but its values can be negative or positive. And then its density looks like this on the left and its, its distribution function looks like this on the right. So it's called the Gumbel distribution, or it's also been called the double exponential distribution. Now, we want to uh, draw a sample from the distribution or from a, uh, a discrete distribution, just like I, I uh, showed you on the previous slide. We want to we want to generate one sample, and this discrete distribution has a a, a vector a, pro, a a vector of probabilities pi. Uh, these are greater or these are non-negative, and they sum to one. And we want to sample uh, p hat that takes its values in zero all the way up to p. Now we don't actually know the probability vector pi. But we do know a pi star, where pi star is proportional to pi. It's pi multiplied by some constant c that's greater than zero. So define lambda star to be just the log of, of pi star. So it's equal to the log of pi plus the log of this constant. And let's generate um, p plus one independent gumbel variance. And then and then finally, let's define alpha star to be lambda star that unnormalized log probability plus the Gumbel variant. And then take P hat to be the the maximizer of all of these alpha stars. Then uh, the following is true. It's that it's that the probability that P hat our random variable is equal to P is equal to pi of p. And what this means is that instead of uh, normalizing pi star and then drawing a sample, we can skip the normalization process altogether. And we can simply, uh, we can simply uh, add gumbel noise to the log probabilities and then take the maximum. And we've effectively drawn a sample from the discrete distribution that we're interested in. So then uh, this is the exact same uh, thing. I'm just writing it up in, in a prettier algorithmic form. We start with our unnormalized log probabilities, uh, lambda star. 
which is, uh, and uh, we have a probability vector over P plus one element, and uh, the result is a single sample uh, P hat drawn from the discrete distribution that we're interested in. And, and uh, the simple way that we do that is all that we do is we generate uh, P plus one Gumbel variates, we add them to our log probabilities, and uh, we say that P hat, uh, the arg max, is, is our random variable. That's it. It's simple, uh, but it's a cool magic trick that kind that that combines or joins together uh, discrete optimization and uh, and probability. So that's the end of the detour, and uh, now I want to return to parallel MCMC. So then this is the uh, the parallel MCMC algorithm written using uh, the Gumbel Max trick. So we uh, we input. A, a, a an initial Markov chain state theta naught. We uh, we input the total length of the chain s, and then we also input the uh, the the total number of proposals p that we want to use. Now for each iteration, we say that theta naught is our previous Markov chain state. We generate our theta bar uh, from a distribution centered at theta naught. Then we generate a uh, uh, a single Gumbel variant uh, associated to theta naught. And then uh, for P in one to big P, we're going to generate another uh, normal, another Gaussian variant, and uh, we're gonna generate another Gumbel variant. And then uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to take the minimum over the log target distribution Right, so now because of the Gumbel Max trick, we're able to throw out the normalization term uh, plus the Gumbel variant. And now I'm saying uh, we're taking the minimum. Uh, of course, it's equivalent to taking the maximum of the uh, when if we remove this negative mark. But I'm saying uh, the minimum because we're getting ready to use a quantum computer, and uh, for some reason it's it's quantum minimization here. So here's the main idea, is that we're going to use a quantum circuit to obtain that p hat, that minimum, among uh, from p equals zero to big P, of, of uh, the negation of a Gumbel variant plus the log target density. And we can do that using a quantum computer in, in, uh, in time that is, uh, so we can achieve a quadratic speed up. As I'm sure you know, but I will. I will um, quickly. I'll I'll I'll, I'll go over uh, the exact way that I choose to do this. At the end of the day, it's using uh, the algorithm of, of Durr and Hoyer, and uh, but I'll but I'll break down all the different parts uh, because there's actually something pretty cool about quantum uh, parallel MCMC, which allows us to take advantage of of something called worm starting, and I'll talk about that. So anyway, the general structure, Grover search algorithm, embeds inside the exponential searching algorithm, embeds inside the, the quantum minimization algorithm. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on Grover search because I know that all of you are experts and aware of, of Grover search, but uh, I just want to briefly lay out the context, which is that we have a, fun, a function f uh, defined on a discrete set from zero to n minus one, and then uh, and and that this function is binary. It maps for, to either zero or one. If if uh, an argument x maps to one, we're going to call that a solution. And then uh, something else that's important is uh, is that and here I'm just talking about Grover search when I have a single solution, although it's easily generalized beyond that and I'll discuss this in the next slide. Uh, but uh, an important thing here and I'll and I'll remark on this again is that we have an integer which I'm calling big R, which is the ceiling of pi times the square root of n divided by four. And this is going to change depending on the number of solutions that we have, but let's just keep it simple now for a single solution. And and what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, with n plus one qubits, 
just fixed at zero and and one, and then we're going to put the first ones into superposition and change the last and change the last register to the negative state. And and then what we're going to do is and you know this already uh, is we're going to apply our Grover iterations where we can represent each Grover iteration as a product of two matrices of two householder matrices. And 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 what we do, what we end up with is a uh, is a quantum state where the first register is going to with high probability be equal to a solution and we just perform the measurement. Uh, we're going to if we if we perform the correct number of of Grover iterations, then we're going to get the true state or excuse me, we're going to get the solution state with high probability. So uh, I just programmed this up on my computer to see how these probabilities change with time uh, or the number of Oracle evaluations or Grover iterations. So the X axis here is the number of Grover iterations. Uh, the Y axis is the probability of success. Uh, we're, we're searching over 16,000 items. And then um, the, we're also looking at different numbers of solution sets, where blue uh, is 256, 128, all the way down, and then we have all the way to one. So on the far left, we have 256. Uh, and you can see that after a very small number of Grover iterations, we're already at a high probability of success. And then for one on the other end, we need to use a lot more Grover iterations to get to uh, a high probability of success. And uh, and and this is great. Um, and then the immediate question for our application or my application today is what happens when I generate uh, what happens when I don't know the number of solutions? Because that's going to be important in the context of quantum minimization. Well, it turns out that if you don't know M, uh, the number of solutions, then you can you can screw up pretty badly. Uh, and actually, the probability of success oscillates. So if I stop at the right place, then good for me. But if I don't, then I can have a close to zero probability of success. So then Boyer and others, as as I'm I'm assuming I, I'm pretty sure that you you know uh, Boyer and others. They uh, they solved this problem by starting with a small number of iterations, Grover iterations, and then checking to see if they found a solution. And if they hadn't, they uh, they applied a little bit more Grover iterations, and then they checked to see if they had a solution. And, and they did this over and over again. Uh, applying an increasing number of Grover iterations at each uh, at each step, and and uh, what they what they found was that uh, and this is actually what I'm showing you right here is the the theoretical algorithm that they call the infinite algorithm uh, because if a solution exists, then they find it, um, but if no solution exists, the algorithm runs forever. Now we don't have time for that. So an interesting question is, well, when can I actually stop the algorithm and still have a high probability of success? So again, uh, I wanted to see what this looks like on my own computer, because uh, I don't know why, but that's fun for me. Uh, so, I, so the Y axis here is the number of Oracle evaluations, the number of Grover iterations, um, and then I've got uh, the case of one solution, five solutions, 10 solutions, 15 solutions, and 20 solutions. And then I'm also looking at different uh, sizes of my search set. So blue on the far left, that's over 16,000 items that I'm searching over. Next, I have over 8,000, and then all the way down to 1,000 items. Now, if, if the number of solutions is a lot less than N, then the expected total number of Grover iterations is bounded uh, by a specific number. Uh, it's it's bounded by it's bounded by uh, nine fourths times the square root of n over m. Uh, now, this is going to be 
this upper bound is going to be at its largest when I only have one solution. So these um, these horizontal lines are the value uh, 9 over 4 times the square root of n. And something that I noticed is that actually these are very good upper bounds. Uh, they're, they, they give me, uh, what I mean is they're very conservative upper bounds, that I'm, I n I'm never observing actually any, uh, any situations, and this is over 500 independent uh, trials. I'm never uh, going beyond that. So uh, actually, I think in, in their paper, in the Boyer paper, they select 9 over 2. Uh, time square root of n as their stopping time, but I found that it's actually pretty uh, pretty good to use nine fourths times the square root of n. So uh, so next, Durr and Hoyer are going to take the exponential searching algorithm, and they're going to embed that inside a minima in, inside a minimization uh, algorithm, where now f is no longer a binary function. Um, but it, it's going to be a function to unique integer values. And, uh, and then I've got an error tolerance epsilon here, which I would prefer to be small. And then I've got uh, M naught, which is the expected total time to success. Now, um, what I'm going to return is, is, a, is a string X naught uh, that satisfies F of X naught is the minimum of F over that set. And I'm going to return it with probability greater than one minus epsilon. And the way that I do this is I'm going to, or the way that they do this rather, is uh, I start with S. S is my counter, which is saying how much time has passed. Um, I'm going to randomly, and this is very important, I'm going to randomly select an X naught from the uniform distribution on the set from zero to N minus one. And then uh, while the amount of time that I've spent is less than uh, M naught divided by epsilon, I'm going to repeatedly step through this process where I'm going to prepare my initial state. I'm going to mark all of the items in my set for which the all the items X for which F of X is less than F of X naught. That's this phrase right here. Uh, after that, I'm going to add a little bit of time and then I'm going to apply the quantum searching uh, algorithm. So I'm going to mark all states uh, for which f of x is less than f of x naught, and then I'm going to apply the uh, exponential searching algorithm from the previous page. Now, the exponential searching algorithm has a variable amount of time, so I'm actually going to record the number of Grover iterations, i, in each step, and I'm going to add that to my time. Finally, uh, for each one of these loops at the very end of the loop, I'm going to obtain some X prime uh, by measuring the first register. And if F of X prime is, is less than F of X naught, then I'm going to say X naught uh, or X prime is the new X naught. So if I have found something where I'm moving downhill, I'm going to accept that. I'm going to say that that's my new state. Now, a key thing uh, from the previous slide is when I begin, I'm randomly selecting some some initial state from my from my search set. And um, my question here is, what if we know a good guess of the minimum? Uh, so so then uh, this is something that in the optimization literature we'd call warm starting. And, and so I, I, I say here that if um, the algorithm begins uh, at a threshold uh, such that f of x is less than that threshold for k minus one items. So if it begins at the rank k item, uh, then we actually have a different expected total number of time steps. And as a matter of fact, it improves on the uniform sampling uh, quite a lot. So M naught K is my uh, my new, uh, it's my warm starting uh, expected number of time steps. And M and M naught is my usual one that I get from uh, just starting with from by sampling from a uniform distribution. And uh, you can see that actually it's going to get smaller 
as uh, it's going to get smaller as k gets smaller because we subtract something that's inversely related to the square root of k. And then uh, at the same time, uh, on, in this right hand term, it's again the same. It's that k is less than n, so this term is negative. And as k gets much less, much it gets increasingly smaller than n, that negative term is going to become smaller and smaller. So it is a good idea to start at a at a, a low rank. And again, I, I, I turned on my computer and said, OK, well, what does this look like for different uh, starting ranks? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, and then we have different ends. And you can see that as we as we increase our starting rank, actually the number of Oracle evaluations, the number of Grover iterations, is going to increase. And then when we use the early stopping uh, mechanism that I referred to earlier, that, that 9 over 4 times the square root of n, we observe a failure rate uh, in practice that's around 1 in 200. So, so it's, it's minimal. OK, so this is the final algorithm then. It's that uh, this is quantum parallel MCMC. This is combining uh, our centered proposal that uses theta bar with our uh, our Gumbel uh, max trick. And then uh, finally, with warm starting quantum minimization. So uh, in order to actually uh, get P hat, which is going to be the index for our proposal, that's going to be our next state. Uh, we do quantum minimization uh, of this term that I discussed uh, earlier. It's this Gumbel max, uh, or excuse me, this Gumbel variate plus the log uh, density evaluated at theta p. And then we're going to start the minimization at the zeroth item. That's the item that uh, that relates to the current state. And and the reason is is because as we uh, advance our Markov chain, the current state state is typically in a high density region, whereas the proposed states can leave the high density region of the target distribution. A uh, case in point, uh, and just to give an idea, you know, the optimal tuning for something like uh, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm uh, in a special setting, though, that uh, is going to have an acceptance rate of, you know, 25%. So that means that you're actually going to be staying at the initial state quite a bit. In terms of the Gumbel max trick, that means that the current state is going to be that optimum, that minimizer, uh, very often. So here, uh, my target distribution is uh, actually multivariate normal distributions with different dimensionalities. Uh, 150 dimensions, 300 dimensions, 600, all the way up to 2400. And I, I see that actually the behavior of the algorithm is the same uh, regardless of this dimensionality. So the y-axis is the number of Grover iterations that I actually need to perform at each MCMC iteration. Um, I'm using 2000 proposals at each MCMC iteration. So this is, uh, so up here, this, this dotted line up here is how many evaluations I would need to do using a conventional computer. Uh, and then the x-axis is the number of MCMC iterations. So you can see that this number of actual evaluations that we're doing uh, using the quantum computer is significantly less than using the conventional computer. And then I, uh, I zoom in on the right, and I'm looking at the effect of the burn-in. That is, uh, I'm starting far away from the, the center or the high density region of the target distribution. And you can see that actually it's a small effect, but you can see that as I, as I actually burn in, as I move toward the higher density region, I actually require less um, Oracle evaluations at each, uh, at each step of my uh, Markov chain. So in total, I'm using in this run, 
uh, I used 7% of the conventional 2000 target valuations, and I only got one out of 200 failures to actually sample from the true, the true distribution. So one question is, well, if I am failing to actually sample from the target distribution, well, then does that bias my Markov chain? Uh, here, I'm looking at the quality of my samples by looking at the sample quantiles, and I've got one for each dimension of a 100-dimensional Gaussian target. And then, uh, and then on the y-axis, I have the theoretical quantiles. So I want these to uh, basically, I want the samples to basically lie on the line uh, x or y equals x. I want it to be on a perfectly um, 45 degree angle, right? Although that's not the angle because of, of the way that this presents. But so I want them to be on these gray lines. And now I've added a, uh, the target dimension to each one of these just so that we can visualize all of the uh, all of these at once. And what I see, and I don't know if you, you're used to looking at, this is called a QQ plot, a quantile quantile plot, but we, we see that, uh, that we actually do get the performance that we want, the accuracy that we want. Okay, and then finally, uh, the, last, the, the last little experiment that I'm going to show you today is, uh, is a, 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 uh, another toy uh, example, but this is a mixture of many Gaussians. That's my target distribution. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it has 1,000 modes or 1,000 wells that I've placed along this, this line. And then uh, this is the first 11 modes. And then, uh, and then on the right, uh, we've got a visualization of all 1,000 modes. And I've placed each one of these modes uh, far apart from one another as a function of their 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 width so that um, it's hard to move between them. Um, I'm so over five independent experiments. I uh, I use an implementation of uh, of QPM CMC using 1000 proposals, uh, using 5000 proposals and then using 10,000 proposals. So, so quite a quite a large number of proposals, and then uh, what I do for each one of these chains is I'm I run the chain until I get to a point that I want to, which is until I've generated 100 effectively independent samples. So again, uh, the way that I compute that is I am going to take the um, the the total number of Markov chain states, and I'm going to divide by the autocorrelation. So I'm going to run each chain until I have 100 uh, effectively independent samples, until my effective sample size is equal to 100. Now, uh, for 1,000 proposals, for the 1,000 proposal iteration, I require um, over or close to 250,000 MCMC iterations just to get 100 independent samples. Um, if I increase the number of proposals to 5,000, then I only require um, just a little over 14,000 so, uh, MCMC iterations. So I'm sampling much more efficiently when I increase the number of proposals that I'm using. And then finally, when I increase to 10,000 proposals, uh, I perform even better. So now I, I only need about 6,000 MCMC iterations. Um, this is not what's important though, right? What's important is how many target evaluations are required because that's the computational bottleneck. That's the expensive thing to do. So now let's look at the target evaluations. Uh, for 1,000 proposals, I, uh, I need to perform almost 25 million target evaluations just to get 100 independent samples. Uh, when I increase that to 5,000 proposals, I, I only need uh, a little over 3 million 
target evaluations, which is still a lot. And then finally, uh, when I when I increase to 10,000 proposals, I only need on the order of 2 million target evaluations. Now, if we if we look at the ratios of these numbers, we could consider the speed up uh, as measured by the ratio of the target evaluations. And I, I place that actually over here all the way on the right. I call that the efficiency gain. Oops. The efficiency gain is the ratio and the number of target evaluations. So uh, first we have one because we're, we're comparing to uh, the 1000 proposal algorithm. Uh, when we increase to 5000 proposals, we have an efficiency gain that's almost eightfold. That's pretty good. And then and then when we increase to 10,000 uh, iterations, that is a uh, we get an efficiency gain that's almost 13 fold. So that's pretty significant. And then finally, um, less important, but I think very impressive is uh, is this, which is the, the computing time speed up. So here uh, the question is, well, how much faster is my is my algorithm than a conventional computer if I use a quantum computer? And uh, and the thousand proposals are are ten times as fast. Uh, the 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 five thousand were then twenty times faster than a conventional computer, and then finally the um, the ten thousand proposal uh, implementation we are thirty times faster than a conventional computer. Um, so uh, I think that these are some some interesting kind of preliminary results. Um, and uh, I've got a number of different ideas of how we can extend this uh, to different settings. So my big thoughts, uh, I have a number of thoughts, a number of questions about uh, how to move forward. But the first one is, well, the real interesting idea here is combining the Gumbel Max trick with 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 quantum minimization that combining. It doesn't need to involve quantum parallel or parallel MCMC at all, so we could throw out the entire MCMC uh, bit and just use quantum minimization and the Gumbel Max trick to sample directly from, you know, a physics model like like the easing model. Right, so that's just directly sampling. We could get that quadratic speed up. Uh, just by directly targeting an easing model. And that could be effective if, you know, the model is. Small enough. Um, but we could also actually apply this quantum parallel MCMC to physics models again. And and uh, one way that we could do this is we could uh, the same way that I use that centered Gaussian proposal, um, we could use a centered proposal uh, to simplify the acceptance probabilities. And we can certainly construct centered program, uh, excuse me, centered symmetric proposals uh, using discrete message, uh, discrete metrics. Again, uh, we could target uh, an easing model or something similar. And then uh, my final um, my final comment, and this is just um, about my own ignorance, which is that you know the quantum minimization technology that I use uh, in this algorithm is is old, right? It's from the 90s. So one question is, well, you know, what has been done since then that could be helpful in this context? Thank you. question from the audience. Hello, uh, thank you for your nice talk. I'm yeah. just uh, curious about your final thought. Um, what's the advantage and disadvantage when you use, use, use the quantum parallelism to the sample X directly? Or to the like different proposal in the MCMC. What was the difference that you you saw that there may be there? Okay, so okay, big, 
the big picture is that there's a reason why we use MCMC. We use MCMC. Uh, MCMC is typically uh, it typically helps with sampling in the situation that we uh, that we have a high dimensional target, or you know, if we're talking about easing model, if we have you know, uh, if we have uh, a, a very large lattice, then direct sampling is going to perform very poorly. Um, it's going to be very computationally intensive. Uh, so then the uh, so then so then the question is for MCMC can we use symmetric proposals in this in the context of uh, a lattice? And I think that we can. And the reason this is a reminder. The reason that we're interested in using symmetric proposals is because they get rid of that uh, quadratic complexity that's involved in computing each one of the proposed densities uh, in all p plus one uh, acceptance probabilities. So, to, so two answers to the question. One, prefer MCMC in high dimensional settings or in, when we're dealing with big models. And then uh, we and then the symmetric proposals help to speed up uh, the actual acceptance probability calculations. Okay, thank you. Um, my another question is uh, when when we do the quantum parallelism to the different proposal, uh, is there any uh, possibility that we can also check their uh, their constraint, like if this sample can be satisfied to some inequality or some like uh, living in some uh, uh, linear matrix inequality, any constraint, for example. OK, that's a that's an interesting question. And for me, um, I just want to clarify. I'll, I'll ask another question because so I have some other MCMC research in which I create a Markov chain that follows constraints. So, and this is usually in a um, for continuously valued uh, samples. So this is something like uh, actually performing MCMC so that I'm said I'm staying on a, on a Riemannian manifold, something like that. But how does that relate to? I, I'm not really sure what kind of constra constraints you're interested in. So we all just ask that question. So uh, I'm thinking that if the sample sampling is from some uh, to do some sampling in the in the matrix, and this matrix uh, satisfies some property, for example, so if they are in a different, uh, the sample to, to a matrix, not, not just different vector, is it possible to generalize in this case? Uh, I, I assume that it is possible. The, the only thing that could be difficult is um, maintaining those symmetric proposals. You know, like the one that I, I'm, mine are taking, um, position in real values, right? Or, you know, they're in some Euclidean space. So I'm using that that center trick for that, that Gaussian proposal. Um, the question is whether there's some geometry, um, even if you're sampling over these matrices, uh, is there some geometry there that you can use to somehow construct a symmetric proposal? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So you mean I need to clarify what kind of uh, space they are living in, and maybe if there is some continuous uh, changing, yeah, there that 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 be good for use. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.
Okay. Any other questions? Uh, so, um, Andrew, uh, this is a very nice and interesting talk because uh, in our oops, because in our uh, center we are actually uh, trying to see what realistic problems could be solved by a quantum computer with practical advantage. And I, I really like your your figure uh, that demonstrate the the, the speed uh, improvement compared to the popular approach, and and I, I think that's that's very useful and and uh, interesting in our communities. Uh, in fact, Bo Jin he he is an expert on uh, quant uh, quantum works, and he also knows this minimization uh, along with other other tricks. So. We, we will be interesting to follow it up if you if you if you wish we could we could really team up and and, and propose uh, uh, strategies that probably suits in for your need yeah that that would be amazing I mean yeah the, of course yes that would be wonderful I'd love okay. to keep wonderful. so so I, so I would ask Gojin to follow it up and do you mind that uh, I wonder whether you could share your slides. Oh, sure, okay. sure. Yeah, of course. OK, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful talk. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you very much for the invitation. OK, so we will chat soon. Bye. OK.